Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Jen, for this introduction uh, and welcome to the first session of this privacy camp. I'm going to call to join me on the virtual stage uh, the speakers of today's panel. Um, Noémie Levin from La Quadrature, uh, Rena Tangens uh, from Digital Courage, and Patrick Breyer, uh, member of the European Parliament. Um, the time to join, I'm going to introduce a little bit what we're going to talk in this room uh, today. Uh, it's not a session where we're going to analyze what has been going on on data retention um, on the political and legislative stages, so to say. There's been already quite a few events about like thinking what has been done in the past years in terms of case law, uh, in terms of litigation uh, by civil society groups. No, here we, what we want to do is really to focus on action, mobilization, what can be done in the next stages uh, and in the next years as civil society um, to combat new initiative, uh, new uh, laws at national and EU levels that will be proposed uh, to maintain either data retention regime that exists or to propose new type of uh, mass surveillance uh, type of regimes, uh, like in many EU countries now. Um, the idea is that we collectively brainstorm about the next step or how civil society, civil society can mobilize uh, people against their attention. Um, it's still like a big uh, challenge when we think about data retention uh, and explain it to a layperson on the street, uh, how it can impact her or him. And this is something we need to collectively think about because uh, the story is not uh, at the end, unfortunately, although we, we thought it would <laughs> after the, the last uh, Court of Justice uh, re, uh, case law uh, and case. Um, and for that, we will reflect uh, with our speaker about the state of play. Um, we will think about what are the current challenges, what has changed in the past 10 years or maybe 20 years on this topic. Uh, how can we approach it from a different perspective, maybe, to be more effective? Um, and for that, maybe it's, it's a good idea that with our speakers, we reflect on the past, uh, what we have done in the past that has worked, what has work less, uh, how we can improve things. And we can also start like brainstorming collectively what what about what can we be doing in the future in the coming years. Um, so for that, I will be accompanied by uh, Patrick Breyer, if he's here. I hope I have my speakers. Uh, Rena Tangens, you can all like uh, switch. Maybe while the technical issues are being solved, Guillermo, can I ask the public who they are, maybe? Like, uh, are the polling questions ready? Here Sorry, I can second. hear you now. Cool. Can hear uh, you was, I, was I gone for a few, few seconds? Yeah, I just, I just would like to invite the people to the stage Noemi, hi. Hello. <laughs> I had some issue with my camera, but I'm here. It's okay. It's the first session. <laughs> Look at my face. <laughs> it's still in the morning. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Rena. Hi. <laughs> 
And while we're waiting for Patrick, I think Patrick is joining us as well. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask a little bit who we have in the in the public to see like what kind of like people are following us this morning and whether they can participate uh, in the brainstorm. Um, so I prepared some questions to you. If it's possible to share them in the chat, um, I directed myself to the. Yeah, exactly. Have you ever worked on data retention? Yes or no? Ah, so uh, a third approximately of the people of the viewers have already worked on it. Uh, two third actually not. Um, the next question then is dependent on the first question. So I'm addressing the the the, the one third um, who already worked on data retention with the second question. I wanted to know, like, how for how long have you worked on it? Like, is it like less than three, five years? Yeah, like you're. Whoa. But only one person could actually answer. This is too bad. That was too fast. <laughs> Sorry, one second. No problem. <laughs> this is the testing session. <laughs> you haven't been told. <laughs> too early in the morning, exactly. So for those of you who already worked on it, for how long have you been working on it is interesting. The, the, the interest we have is that because the in this question is that some of our speakers have really long term experience. I'm looking at you, Rena, and uh, some maybe less. Uh, and it's interesting because you're coming from different perspectives, different angle. Okay, uh, among the people who said they worked on it, um, some of them worked less than five years uh, and more than 10 years. So we have like the two extreme. Uh, it's not super representative, obviously, but uh, still interesting to know. And the last question for me was to know from which angle did you approach this topic? Um, like, was it mainly like artistic engagement or was it like more advocacy? So if the the last question could be asked. Hi, Patrick. Yeah, everybody's here now. <laughs> cool. I'm just asking the last question to the people in the public who had the chance to work on data retention before. Yeah, so what I wanted to know is from those of you who worked on it, and it's it's fine if you didn't in the past, uh, there's still a chance to catch up and we need all the energy possible on this topic. But from those of you who worked on data retention before, was it, and where did you start it working on it? Like mainly advocacy, working towards legislative change, mainly research, maybe in academia, uh, mainly tech self-defense, let's say, like finding solutions to uh, work against uh, the retention of your personal data or mainly campaign, you organize protests on the streets again, like on this topic um, or any other. And if you have like, we, you've done something other than that, um, please share it in, this, in the chat. I really encourage like all of you, all the viewers to uh, use the chat during the session to share your experience and share maybe if even if you haven't worked on data retention, but you've been uh, campaigning or working on a specific topic related to surveillance, do not hesitate to, to share it. 
Uh, once the results are in on the chat, uh, I'll consult them and the speakers as well. But I think this is good for the speakers to know who uh, is following us. Um, we could, I, I'm going to actually head and um, give the floor uh, to Patrick um, because the in the first stage, I just wanted to, we just wanted to uh, remind everybody what the state of play is. So we actually shared the same level of knowledge about what has been going on on data retention in the past years. Um, so I think it, it's good that we go over uh, what happened. Uh, we thought we won on it. We thought we had a big case. We, we, we almost did it. Uh, and now actually it's starting all over again. Why is this topic still important today, Patrick? And uh, could you summar summarize for us the latest uh, political uh, steps we saw? Of course. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for organizing this panel. And I'm glad that we have uh, um, activists among our listeners, so many who have been engaged in, in this fight for so long, as I can tell uh, from the poll. So it's wonderful to be having this panel and uh, wonderful panelists. And um, it's a good time to, to discuss data retention. Just to, to remind you um, what's so special about uh, data retention in comparison to storage of other kinds of data. It is just simply information that reflects our daily communications and our daily movements and also the IP addresses that we use on the internet that can be used to reconstruct our online activities. So um, unlike with other data, it is very comprehensive. It, it exposes your social network, it exposes um, our personal uh, connections and, and problems uh, possibly. Um, it allows forecast your behavior to deduce patterns, movements, etc. So it's extremely sensitive data and it's being retained without any uh, business need or any other um, necessity to do so. So that's why um, the European Court of Justice um, decided in a landmark um, decision, a Digital Rights Island, that it is Sorry, I think uh, we lost the image. Is it better now? Yeah, and I think you yeah. were for a few seconds. Just the last sentence where I was. Okay. The, the uh, EU Court of Justice decided it's not proportionate to um, uh, retain and, and collect um, information about the communications and locations of the entire population that are completely unconnected to any crime whatsoever just because they might be of interest in the future. And uh, that was really um, a landmark decision, but it was never um, really implemented, except maybe in those countries where uh, the specific decision was taken, but not even there. So in Ireland, for example, they still have indiscriminate data retention in place. And um, so basically, uh, member states refused to um, to heed it, to implement it, and the Commission refuses to enforce it because the Commission is of a different view itself. In fact, even the European Data Protection Supervisor in those court proceedings argued something along the lines that um, uh, the retention is not the problem, it's about the access, which is not true because the, it's the retention that has the chilling effect. The knowledge that um, uh, your communications, your behavior could be used against you. That is what has the chilling effect. And yet, um, member states ignored it and uh, challenged it. And um, what happened was that they did actually manage that the court um, watered down um, its jurisprudence and its case law. And in the latest decision, allowed for a measure of of um, uh, data retention uh, where uh, in case of a threat to national se security, um, which is used by France, for example, to argue, well, we have a permanent threat to our national security, and so we'll just retain everything all the time. And of course, we'll allow um, prosecutors to use it for prosecuting crime as well. Um, they have allowed for the so-called targeted data retention, so you can retain data in certain areas. And that is being used um, by member states such as Denmark or um, Belgium um, to have basically, um, you know, 80% or 90% of the country covered. 
um, with some reasons, above average crime rate, that there are railway stations, whatever you, you have it. And um, basically, it means that in those countries, um, people are nearly as exposed uh, to having their data retained as according to the indiscriminate uh, regime. And um, also, they allowed for indiscriminate retention of IP addresses, even though that allows for reconstruction of, um, of the online activities in combination with the log files that are being kept. And um, what happened last, last year, what was revealed, was that the Commission already released a paper to propose to member states how they could bring back data retention um, in line with the court requirements by interpreting them very extensively. And um, uh, the only reason why member states are not enthusiastic about it is that they basically would prefer to ignore the court rulings altogether and go along with their existing law, indiscriminate and for all data types. And um, uh, so there is a threat that despite some positive developments, such as in the German coalition um, treaty and agreement, um, that this da data retention will be imposed by way of the EU level on all member states. And that's why it's a really good time to act now, because this is at early stages. Uh, the Commission has collected feedback from member states. They are waiting for a court decision on Germany's data retention regime that's coming up in the next few months. And then they will act. And it is clear that the Commission will propose um, a, a maximum measure possible. They actually consider extending data retention to OTT services, which would for the first time include messaging services, um, possibly video uh, uh, conferencing uh, services, internet email, etc. Um, they could actually mandate identification. So um, it could eliminate um, anonymous accounts. Uh, and that's, all that is a real threat that needs addressing. So it's very timely to be having this panel today. Thank you so much, Patrick, for the very good summarize. Uh, so we hear it well. I think what the Commission is planning is still very unknown, and I'm not sure they have a good idea themselves what they want to do, actually. Uh, but this is our to our advantage because we can come and be prepared when uh, the proposal comes out. And in any case, we need some uh, mobilization currently at national level where member states are pushing more or less for a renewed regime on data retention um, in their domestic laws. Um, before maybe we like think about uh, future action and what can be done and learn a little bit from La Quadrature du Net uh, case, I wanted to turn to Rena. Rena, you are an activist, like a really long-term activist in data protection. You co-founded Digital Courage, which had a different name at the time. Um, uh, that I'm not going to try to pronounce. <laughs> uh, you funded the Big Brother Awards uh, and you were also using arts uh, at the time uh, to um, to fight against a surveillance issue in Germany. And I wanted to learn, and I think a, a lot of people in, in the public could learn from your experience and uh, all your uh, past mobilization. Um, could you tell us a little bit more how you became active on the topic? Uh, what did you do? It was in the 2000s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, can you tell us a little bit more? How did you organize? How did you find partners? Uh, what did you do? And what do you think were your main victories? Hey, yes, uh, sure. It's a pleasure. Uh, um, actually, we started back in 1987, <laughs> and uh, that was uh, um, the decade where um, the uh, big census in Germany uh, should have happened, which um, uh, then led to the Constitutional Court uh, ruling for informational self-determination, which is a really important ruling. Um, and everything else uh, relies on that uh, in terms of data protection law. Um, so that was uh, the time when a lot of people were active on this and we had demonstrations and so on in the, in the 80s against the census. Um, well, um, 
um, I should mention that uh, I'm not doing artwork to make something pretty uh, and have a, a cool uh, thing to show for uh, for uh, demonstrations, but um, our concept of art is different. We um, we rely actually on the French composer Eric Satie. Uh, his music was not meant to listen to, but to have it in the background and create a good atmosphere. So everyone feels comfortable. And um, uh, it's uh, actually the music uh, tries to be boring. So you are not distracted, but you come to the point where you want to be active yourself. So um, th this, in very short, uh, the artistic concept, um, we applied also to political uh, and legal situations, um, which also create a room where you find c yourself comfortable and uh, wanting to, to, uh, um, uh, to contribute something, uh, or you think you should rather uh, stay quiet and uh, don't do anything that attracts attention. And uh, we think in a democracy, we need uh, people to, to feel comfortable, to, to, um, uh, to feel um, confident, uh, to participate in, 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 in the democratic uh, process. And people can't do that when they feel under surveillance all the time. So that in very short is uh, the artistic background of what we do. <laughs> um, well, uh, about data, so we worked for uh, data protection, privacy already since 87, but um, on data retention, this started in December 2005. Um, uh, there the directive um, um, came into place and uh, we had a first meeting of um, different people from different organizations and also individuals at the Chaos Communication Congress. This is the, the biggest uh, uh, hacker uh, meeting and that was uh, taking place in, um, I'm not sure, was it Hamburg or Berlin already? I'm not sure, <laughs> maybe it was Berlin. Um, and um, uh, there very different people came from the uh, critical um, people against globalization of attack. Uh, there were people of the hackers from the Chaos Computer Club um, uh, and there were data protection officials actually taking, were, uh, taking part and um, uh, some activists. And this group decided we have to do something on data retention because this has the potential to be really threatening for everybody. Uh, as you can, um, uh, you can figure out what someone is doing because you can follow them, their location, um, all their social networks, as Patrick explained already. Uh, so um, th there was uh, a mailing list was created and we decided we have to work together and that was great because uh, more organizations and more individuals joined in. And uh, the interesting thing is uh, that um, we were successful to, uh, to make people understand that everybody is really uh, um, uh, uh, is affected. So we had um, uh, groups uh, joining in. Uh, you would not expect there that, like uh, doctors, uh, journalists, lawyers, um, also therapists, and uh, we had the um, AIDS, HIV counseling, the telephone counseling of the Protestant church in Germany <laughs> and uh, so on, because they all saw that uh, the, it has a chilling effect when people can't call uh, a counseling line like, like this. Um, when they think this is all recorded, uh, that the fact that they have been calling there allows uh, the, um, uh, um, that you think uh, they might be ill or something or have a, a psychological problem. Uh, so I think one of the uh, secrets of the success was that we 
uh, actually um, were um, successful to attract a lot of different organizations that were opposing data retention for different reasons. And um, we started uh, organizing demonstrations. Uh, the, um, the really big demonstration that was taking place several years um, was called Freiheit statt Angst in German. And uh, this is uh, where the uh, freedom not fear uh, slogan, the motto of our annual meeting of act European activists in Brussels comes from. Um, uh, Freedom not fear um, or Freiheit statt Angst means uh, uh, we don't want to be protected. Don't uh, make us fearful um, uh, and pretend you want to protect us. Uh, we think democracy uh, and freedom is uh, more to protect. We, we protect it and uh, keep away from us. And um, we actually... Um, were successful to bring people of very different political backgrounds together. We had um, uh, people from the left, the Greens, the Pirate Party, um, and uh, the Liberals, uh, the uh, Free Democrats uh, of Germany. Um, uh, at the same time, there were the anti-capitalist bloc there and uh, uh, a bloc of doctors that came in white, uh, in their white coats. And uh, uh, so it was very colorful and uh, a lot of creative action of uh, people pro who protested. And people um, uh, founded uh, local groups uh, and um, that organized events in their town and made info stands in the pedestrian areas. And uh, so there was a lot of engagement. Um, uh, also because we had uh, a common uh, goal for, uh, uh, in the first place, uh, to stop uh, data retention uh, by the way of the constitutional complaint. Uh, Patrick uh, really earns the, uh, the credits for this. Uh, uh, because I think he wrote most of the uh, text of the constitutional complaint in cooperation with uh, Meinert Storostek, our lawyer, um, uh, which uh, sadly died uh, some years ago. Uh, he was a fantastic person and he, he was always engaged in um, defending freedom and civil rights. Yeah, that was, you see Patrick in one of the early demonstrations uh, making a talk uh, next to Padelun of Digital Courage. And um, we started with 250 people at the demonstration. At the next, uh, there were something like 500 and then more than 1,000. And then we have had uh, 15,000. And uh, then at some time, um, we had, uh, um, we had uh, 50,000. And uh, that was uh, just a fantastic uh, uh, experience to see that. Here you see people of um, Arbeitskreis Vorratsdatenspeicherung. That's a free group uh, with no, um, uh, it's no association uh, in the legal sense, but uh, it was a free association of people. The local groups uh, always called themselves Arbeitskreis Vorratsdatenspeicherung, uh, Bielefeld or Berlin or whatever. And we had a lot of them. Uh, yeah, we had uh, uh, quite a number uh, of demonstrations. That is also in Berlin. Um, and uh, but um, a lot of local uh, initiatives um, uh, who did things um, I would not have recommended. Uh, I would have thought, uh, as uh, as an experienced uh, activist, this does not work. For instance, people. Um, uh, carried a coffin uh, around um, and said um, to, to show we bury democracy, we bury fundamental rights. And we thought this is so boring. People have done that in the 70s, uh, <laughs> you know, but um, most people don't remember this. So um, uh, it actually worked to attract attention. And uh, this coffin was carried around Hamburg, I think that was. And so a lot of creativity and, and actions and uh, to, to activate people happened. Uh, that, was, that was great. And um, of course, um, collecting signatures uh, um, for the um, constitutional complaint was a big thing. 
um, as people saw they can uh, actually have an impact um, when they support this constitutional complaint. And we collected these signatures, not like these organizations who do that online, but uh, people gave their real life signature on paper um, as um, uh, um, it's, um, I don't know the, the term, the exact term, to give the lawyer uh, um, uh, the um, uh, um, the authority to to uh, uh, to apply uh, um, in in their name at the court. So, uh, and this this was the biggest mass uh, constitutional complaint. We had almost thirty five thousand people who signed this, and uh, so we have been uh, bringing. Um, uh, really uh, a lot of paper uh, to the constitutional court for who were the plaintiffs uh, at this court. And um, no, please go back in the picture, Frank. <laughs> um, look at this. Uh, this is Potsdamer Platz in Berlin. You can see how many people uh, attended these demonstrations. And um, the speaker there is uh, Thilo Weichert, who is a uh, data protection officer um, of Schleswig-Holstein um, and uh, there were masses of people and it was a great feeling for everybody to see we are not alone and I think this is the main learning uh, to see we can actually move something, we can have an impact, we can change things and um, a demonstration does not only show this to other people, to politicians but also to any people who are active to see they are not alone. This is a very important function also of a demonstration. Um, well, if we uh, uh, jump on to the next picture, Frank, <laughs> that uh, that was in uh, at the European Court. Um, and I have been attending uh, this in uh, 2013. Uh, I traveled there and the German television was there with me. That was uh, quite fun and I wanted co comments on this. Uh, this was the, the ruling against the uh, directive on data retention and um, I could not believe how, um, how harsh uh, the judges uh, were dealing with these government officials and uh, trying to get information from them why do you have uh, data retention? Why do you think it's useful? And um, as an example, the Austrian government said we had uh, 1,000, no, no, we had 120 cases, more or less. Um, we had, um, we have used uh, data retention on, we couldn't have solved them otherwise. And the judges um, asked um, what was the, uh, what were the crimes? And uh, the guy of the Austrian government said, well, it was, uh, let me see, um, it was fraud, uh, dealing with stolen goods, drug trafficking, and insulting other people. And the judge said, uh, did you have any terrorism uh, cases? And the Austrian guy said, um, uh, 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 no, I can't see any. And the, um, then the judge said, and you have used data retention on cases of insult? Uh, really? And the Austrian guy said, yes, because we had the data anyway. Uh, so we just used it. And so um, I could not believe that he actually said that because he couldn't have given us a better uh, <laughs> uh, argument on that. Um, the, of the function creep, then when, when the data has been collected, it will be used um, because it's there. And uh, um, as, uh, people, organizations, and also corporations might get hold of the data um, as soon as it's collected, uh, something like this will happen. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I was uh, astonished uh, how they, uh, the judges were uh, there um, uh, dealing with the government officials and uh, um, uh, other activists said, oh, uh, this does not mean anything. Uh, they, will, uh, they will not uh, do anything important in the end. But I was very happy to learn afterwards that uh, they actually decided uh, that uh, the, the European directive was not 
um, uh, in terms with the uh, European Charter of Fundamental Rights. Yes. Um, so a very yeah. positive outcome in the end yes. of the yes. of your campaign. So maybe uh, yeah, there, there um, this uh, picture is uh, showing uh, us. Uh, also, you can see Patrick again. <laughs> we are on the when my Tarostik is the guy with the orange scarf. Uh, our lawyer, and we are on the way um, uh, the second time to the Constitutional Court because uh, uh, the um, data retention um, is in place now again. And uh, just one point I want to make uh, is um, uh, that in the first ruling of the Constitutional Court, the court said uh, it's unconstitutional and void the German law on data retention, but it did not say data retention can't be done uh, uh, as such. Um, so under certain conditions, it could be, uh, uh, there could be a law for data retention. But they said um, they have been, them, there are certain conditions. You can't rule the, um, the uh, data retention law just um, uh, as such. You have to look at the context. Are there other laws in place? Uh, and when there is more the surveillance in place, then citizens will feel under surveillance all the time. And this is not uh, possible in a de democracy. So um, the, the term that was coined then is uh, Überwachungsgesamtrechnung. Uh, this means uh, overall account of current surveillance laws. Uh, so uh, the politicians have to uh, take in, um, uh, in account that uh, uh, how, uh, how many other laws are there uh, for surveillance and uh, can't decide for another law adding surveillance to this. And what we have done is we made a list uh, uh, of all the laws that uh, uh, were added on this ten, since 2010. Uh, this is when the Constitutional Court said, no, it's, uh, it's unconstitutional. Um, and um, this was a tedious work. But um, in the end, uh, the Liberal Party uh, Foundation took up the work and uh, this ended up in the German coalition uh, contract. So in Germany, when new laws are de decided on, they, um, the um, uh, German Bundestag must take in a, into account uh, what the total accounting of surveillance laws is. And uh, it's mentioned in the coalition contract and I think this is a big success. Okay, I, um, yeah. I think I I'm make a point here <laughs> and you can uh, ask any Indeed. questions. Of course, you can ask any question to Rena and Patrick already. Uh, thank you so much for this rendition of all the work you've done since uh, the late 90s, actually. And I think this is already shows a lot of great uh, lessons or takeaway we can do for this session. Like, I understand that it was a, a combination of different action, of different types of action. It was advocacy with the list you just mentioned, showcasing how many surveillance laws were already in place. Uh, it was about litigation, bringing actual the case in front of courts, uh, asking for uh, a review of the legality of those laws. But in the end, also uh, showcasing uh, your power by bringing people to the streets in numbers. Uh, and that is very impressive, uh, as well as actually bringing different people uh, around the table and um, highlighting their voice, uh, bringing their voice to the table. Those who we don't think at first might be affected, but are in direct line. So that's already very inspiring, I think, for the for how we could design uh, our own next uh, action in this field. I want to turn to uh, Noemi, who has more uh, recent experience. Noemi is member of La Quadrature du Net, another EDRI member, so, such as uh, Digital Courage. Um, this is our member in France. And now Noemi is also the legal advisor. I would uh, translate it this way <laughs> in English uh, of La Quadrature, uh, recently joined the team. And we are very happy to have her this morning. Um, she also was part of the litigation team at La Quadrature uh, when the case, uh, the French law was brought uh, to just, well, in front of courts and it ended up in this uh, uh, now famous landmark ruling, <laughs> I would say, at the Court of Justice. 
Uh, obviously, the aftermath was uh, very disappointing for you guys. Um, I wanted to know that the reason for that is the Conseil d'État actually circumvented the whole kind of conclusion from the Court of Justice. And I wanted to know how La Quadrature um, lived through this journey. Uh, what did you learn, guys? What was the positive aspect? What was the kind of the defeat or the, the negative things you wouldn't, done, wouldn't have done again? Um, and what are for you the, the next step after this disappointment? How you pass that feeling and how you, are you going to continue uh, working on this topic? Well, hello. Thank you for the invitation first. Uh, well, actually, yes, with La Quadrature, we, we challenge this topic only on a litigation aspect. Uh, and to resume, it was long. It was a long fight. And I think what we can say now, it's, we have a big, uh, very uh, um, sensitive example of how politics and law and litigation can interfere. Because when we first uh, went before the judge, uh, actually the starting point was the digital right island decision that Patrick Breyer uh, talked about. And for us, it was uh, really great. It was a material and substantial argument to to show the judge to to challenge the legality of, of such of such retention and access of data. And so we went uh, on a um, first time before the judge. We were actually ruled out because uh, we were actually the Council of State say that we were misinterpreted the digital right island decision. So we had to wait for the TD2 ruling to go back. And then it was long because why I say we there are interference with politics is that at the same time, there was negotiation on the e-privacy regulation in Brussels. And so we know that France ha had a big part on it. So in our action before the judge at that time, we really stopped during two or three years because the Council of State knew that there was some interest uh, in Brussels. And uh, so we had to wait until 2018 to have our preliminary ruling uh, transmitted to the court. But again, we saw that the Council of State didn't do this just to enforce the law, the, the way of turning the question, the way of drafting the preliminary ruling really asked the court to change its position. So all that time we, we were quite happy, of course, with the TD2 ruling, but we were all, we knew also that, that there was so much interest there was, that this topic is so sensitive when you talk about police and terrorism. So so we, we were really waiting for this decision. And Actually, when uh, the Court of Justice decision uh, came out in 2020, we had kind of mixed feelings because, as Patrick Breyer said, it was creating exemptions. So it was for us kind of weaker, uh, weaker decision, weaker position than the TD2 ruling. But we also believed at the time that France, uh, French law was going to change because it didn't comply with the decision. And so, as you said, the Council of State, so, which is actually for those who don't know the French higher administrative court, well, interpreted it in a way that nothing changed. So it twisted the exception to make uh, the retention and access actually permanent. And as Patrick Breyer said, the exemption of threat to national security was used to say that we are in a permanent threat, a permanent state of emergency, and so that the police and the intelligence services should uh, access, should should have the same power than before. So what are our feelings? Of, of course, we were disappointed, but we were also facing the limit of litigation as the, the council said didn't actually enforce the law, didn't enforce what we have been doing for decades, which is uh, make prevail European law on French law. And so it's more than a disappointment. It's also a loss of faith in this institution. Even I don't know if we had too much faith, but now we don't have any more. And how, how actually the police and the intelligence services can have so much influence. And maybe it's very specific also to 
how France works because I think it can be different in in different member states because in France this Council of State is not uh, made of classical uh, judge. The judge uh, came out from a school that uh, train also the higher executives that go into ministries. So it's the same people that actually judge our case and that also advise the politics. So it's a few hundred of people who are in the higher uh, position of all institutions. So I think what we, after all this year, all, all these years, sorry, what we uh, recall and what we were in face of is that really something cannot ever change. And this institution has hundreds of years, exi have existed for a hundred of years, have very prestigious and historical past. And so we believe that with our legal argument, with our European law, we could make that makes things change and actually we could not and that's how that's why we were disappointed and actually like almost a year later we still don't know what we're going to do we 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 know that litigation cannot be used maybe to such big sub subjects we, we still use it for smaller case or individual case but that's also what's sad is that we, we were trying to to make, uh, to defend a collective subject, a collective cause. And maybe now we have to go back to more individual protection uh, to tell people how they can protect their privacy or maybe to go do litigation on specific criminal individual case. We were still thinking about it uh, because it has been, I think it was six years fight and we went to the highest, it's the highest body in the European Union. So we, at least maybe we could go before the European Court of Human Rights, but there are also a lot of limitations to go before this, this judge. We could, uh, there are also the option of uh, asking the Commission to prosecute friends, but we, are, we cannot do it ourselves. And that's, that's uh, a shame of, in European law because we, we depend on a political body to to uh, pro, to to do this action um, of failure. So actually, we are making maybe a pause <laughs> on uh, on litigation, and that was really interesting to see Rena Rena's uh, history of activism because we are also thinking maybe of doing a mix between litigation and going on the street or may, or, or doing some, as I said, training tell, or also tell people and tell people that they make them aware of, uh, of where the data is going because now that we lose, that we lost, sorry, well, you have to be aware that if you have a phone, you have always, you're always tracked with your location. So yeah, maybe sometime not take it and it's a shame to go this far but today we cannot well the fight for the law is lost so we have to go back to individual protection and so that that's some stuff we, we were thinking about also maybe uh, b before the, the french uh, decision we were we were pushing to to inter to enforce uh, european law instead of, of French show. So, for example, in at, at Quadrature, we have some social network, we host some social network, and we're saying we only uh, keep the logs and the data a few weeks because we have the Chile 2 ruling and we want to enforce this decision. But now that the French law is clearer, well, we can maybe still do it, but we, we put ourselves at risk. But it's all also a way of activism to to actually not apply the law, but with of course all the limits it has. So we, we're thinking about all this, doing a mix of uh, of the of all this way of activism. And if we, I actually, if we had to do it all over all over, all over today, uh, I don't know if if we knew that it was going to end this way. I think we we would not go. Because uh, because we we were thinking that French law will would apply and enforce European law. So actually, it's it's a very difficult question. Uh, maybe we, we would do more specific law, or maybe we would do all 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 the same again. Because 
that also may shed light on this topic in France. And uh, we are waiting to see how this decision is going to be teached in law school because th there were a lot of noise and fuss about, about it here. So we still have mixed feelings. Uh, we are happy to that we went all through this journey, but uh, but it's very difficult. And as you said in the beginning of the of the talk, we have to do it all over again. We had we thought we won, and then maybe we have to to see and observe what was what will going on in every member state in a, in a few years. What the Commission is going to propose, but uh, it's not it's, as uh, as they did is also kind of an attack to European Union law, and uh, it has done quite the same uh, twice in the last year. So I think that's why I said at the beginning it, there are a lot of politics, and there, are, there is a tension right now between France and European Union. Uh, well, that's what we saw. So, of course, maybe we have to have this in mind and wait until it passes, or wait until we have some more idea, or wait until we, we know how to attack it. But of course, we, we won't give up. It's just that uh, such such a big uh, big event like like we had uh, makes as uh, as activists questions of where of our going to a subject and we made all our effort all of our energy into litigation and maybe we just have to wait and put our energy into something else before before coming back but thank you very much for for the cheering and the, and the <laughs> arrangement. Absolutely deserved. Uh, there is a question about exactly, maybe Noemi, you want to just respond directly. Um, there's a, another question from Friedemann about like whether, what do you think the Court of Justice will do when it sees that there's such a almost wrong <laughs> reaction to its own uh, court case? Uh, what do you think the reaction would be? And Luisa also had a question um, to which uh, Patrick actually answered in the chat. Um, about Italy as well, uh, um, obliging retention of metadata for over for six years, I think, and the Commission is not still taking action. So we're pointing again to the same direction of there is the Commission and this is a deadlock. It refuses to do its role under the treaty, uh, like as a guardian of the treaty. Um, is there is this a point where we need to focus on? Um, I'm asking to all the speakers. And we have five minutes left, so be, please be brief. <laughs> I can start quickly on Friedman questions. Uh, actually, it's, it's something we're, we're looking at, and it's interesting to see that in the latest uh, general advocates' conclusion on the same uh, on the same topic, saying that it's okay. We we know we know what the case law is. Stop asking questions. So maybe the court is going to to go on and on uh, saying the same position and that could uh, weaken a uh, member state like France who, are, who has a very narrow interpretation. So uh, what's going to be interesting too is to see if the commission do something to enforce this position, uh, if, if the commission is going to wait to uh, citizens to, to seize it or or if it's going to do some uh, action for failure by itself. So I think it's, uh, as I said, there is a moment of tension right now, maybe in European Union, about enforcing law. And uh, it's only the beginning, so we have a part uh, um, to play in there. Any final words from Patrick or Rena? before we close the session. It's too short. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. Uh, we can tell that we are running out of time before we've had uh, the opportunity to discuss everything and talk with our um, audience. And so I think it will make sense to, um, to keep in touch and um, have uh, more meetings and um, uh, continue the, the networking to um, see uh, internationally what are the developments and how can we challenge them. There's a great doing this at Edry, I'm sure Claire will, will go into that. And um, we will also uh, continue our, our work and try to, to bring people on this. And um, let's, let's, as, as Lena said, let's be really uh, persistent and a pain in the neck.
very great words of conclusion. Yes, indeed, if you want to support uh, um, a network, a tr transnational civil society mobilization, as Luisa put it in the chat, you can join uh, as a member. Um, the members in, Ger in Germany, like Digital Courage, are working on those topics, uh, La Quadrature as well in France. You can go to Edry website, edry.org, and check uh, the map of members and maybe join uh, them and support our efforts. And you can also support, obviously, us uh, at European level. Uh, we'll continue monitoring what the Commission has uh, in mind for the next year. Uh, we have a mailing list uh, that is open to external uh, beside members, um, you can drop an email to me. You'll find my email address on the website as well. And I'm gladly uh, will add you if you want to take part in the mobilization. I take the few seconds left I have to thank my uh, dear speakers. Thank you so much for the great insight. I was super re revigorated for this morning after the talks. And, and I hope we'll do our best uh, to fight against that retention for the years to come. Thank you. Thank you.